or trying to optimize rumen fermentation. That's the beauty of our dairy cow. So we know buffers can actually energize and stabilize uh, the environment, uh, realizing that uh, 70 to 80% of the energy comes from volatile fatty acids, and that's your microbial drive. And we can have over 60% of the amino acids that are being synthesized by the rumen microbes as well. So if we can keep the, we call a, a, a healthy rumen, then we usually have the healthy cow as far as that goes. And buffers really trying to maintain an optimal rumen pH uh, in the digester, in the rumen itself. So hello everyone. Uh, this is Luis Ferrero, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have opportunity to discuss with Dr. Mike Hutchins, Professor Emeritus of University of Illinois. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a, a privilege being able to interact and discuss with you. Uh, so could you please give us a brief background about yourself? You bet, Louise. Uh, very good. First of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to be on the Black Belt podcast. I've, I'm monitoring them. They're, they're done very, very well. I, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm near Green Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, got all my degrees at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and then spent eight years at the University of Minnesota as an extension dairy specialist and also coach of the dairy judging team, and then came uh, after eight, eight years to the University of Illinois, on an extension appointment to head up the dairy extension program. And then uh, due to the retirements, I also started teaching the uh, freshman, <clears throat> sophomore and capstone uh, manage dairy management courses. So in a nutshell, that's pretty much my background. Well, that's a great background. You know, every time we interview someone that has University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, degrees, we are always very proud and happy with that. So, <laughs> But jokes aside, today we have a very important topic to discuss, which is about the use of buffers in dairy diets. And I know that you have some very interesting data about what is the use of buffers in the United States? Yeah, uh, Louise, one, one interesting thing we monitor is the Hordes Dairyman Market Survey, and that comes out every year. And 20, 2024 results, uh, 38%. It's the most popular feed additive uh, of all the feed additives and typically stays right around that 40% level as far as use on dairy farms here in the United States. Yes, yeah, 40% is a great adoption. And, and obviously, as you said, it's probably the most utilized additive in the dairy industry. Why there is so much interest in using buffers for dairy cows? Well, I think, Louise, the, the, the excitement is uh, that uh, we're trying to optimize rumen fermentation. That's the beauty of our dairy cow. So we know buffers can actually energize and stabilize uh, the environment, uh, realizing that uh, 70 to 80% of the energy comes from volatile fatty acids, and that's your microbial drive. And we can have over 60% of the amino acids that are being synthesized by the rumen microbes as well. So if we can keep the, we call a, a, a healthy rumen, then we usually have the healthy cow as far as that goes. And buffers really trying to maintain an optimal rumen pH uh, in the digester, in the rumen itself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I certainly agree that the rumen is the key part for us, dairy nutritionists. Said that, are there different sources of buffers that nutritionists have to pay attention to? Well, certainly, we, Louise, let's, let's talk about the, the two possible roles. Uh, some are, are true buffers. Uh, sodium bicarb would be a good example. It has a pKa, a dissociation constant, around 6.25. And that's exactly where you want that rumen to be operating. So we have what we call buffers. Then we also have alkalizers. And these are neutralized acids in the rumen. So they have a different role. And so generally, Louise, there's about five different ones that we can quickly talk about that uh, nutritionists, dairy farmers, consultants, veterinarians will look at. The most common one, of course, is sodium bicarb. Uh, that has been the, the, the power one as far as that goes. Uh, sodium bicarb typically will maintain that pH very close to around 6, 6.25, which should be optimal for fiber digesting bacteria. The level is 0.75% of the total ration dry matter. So it means as cows eat more dry matter, we have to put more of the sodium bicarb in, into the feeding program there. And of course, it, it, it's very effective from that fact from that aspect as well. So certainly that is probably the most common one that you will run across, and that is a true buffer. Another one you'll find is sodium sesquicarbonate, uh, and that basically is about roughly 50% bicarb and 60% uh, or 50% sodium uh, carbonate. So now we have a buffer and an alkalizer in that product there. And basically all the guidelines developed at the University of Wisconsin says you can substitute it for sodium bicarb. And uh, generally why some companies will do that is it usually is priced slightly lower uh, per ton or per 100 pounds compared to sodium bicarb, but the levels will stay the same and the research looks really quite good. 
The third buffer will be one that perhaps many of us don't think much about, and that's potassium carbonate. A potassium carbonate is, is a buffer uh, used primarily on DCAT equations more than anything else uh, because it is twice as expensive as sodium bicarb. But certainly it, it is a buffer. Their work out of uh, South Carolina shows it's a very effective uh, uh, buffer. They compared bicarb to potassium chloride, and obviously uh, the, the potassium carbonate was the, the real winner. And there are several different commercial companies that market it on the marketplace right now. So that's kind of your, your third buffer. Then let's look at two of what I call alkalizers. The most common one your listeners will be aware of is Magox. And, and, and Magox, of course, is an alkalizer. And typically, we're we'll feeding somewhere around 50 to 60 grams per day. And in most cases, it's combined with bicarb. So therefore, you, you kind of have the buffer and the alkalizer there at the same time. And of course, the Magox also brings magnesium uh, to, to the diet as well. So it has a, a dual role. Uh, Magox is not Magox, uh, depending on particle size, uh, heat treatment, solubility, all those things come into play. So a lot of different sources of Magox from different countries, so eyes wide open on that one as well. And certainly it, it can be a, a very effective. Uh, there is a, a new commercial uh, company uh, that is making Magox. It's coming from France. And so be aware of that one. It, it's got some heat treatment with it. So they claim theirs as a much more uh, stable and a long lasting, a quick and long lasting type product in, in the marketplace as well. Then the last one that maybe you won't even think about, Louise, and that's car calcium carbonate. Uh, notice I didn't say limestone. It's calcium carbonate because limestone is just one form of calcium carbonate. And uh, of course, what it, it tends to be more of a, a, a buffer in the lower part of the GI tract. Uh, the research at Illinois says it doesn't do much in the rumen itself uh, there. And certainly uh, that's another role it can go with as, besides as a source of calcium in the feeding program. And again, right now, there's a new product that's coming on the marketplace that's being actually extracted from the water off the Irish coast. And it's a very high in, uh, in, in, uh, in solubility. It contains about 30% calcium and 6% magnesium. Both of them are very biologically available. And of course, uh, it's available on the marketplace at this point as well. The beauty of that one would be for our listeners is that it can also be used in, in, in uh, close-up dry cows because it will not change the decad, which of course the bicarbs will do that as well. Absolutely. So basically, there are a lot of options there, probably a lot of those that have to be fit together, not necessarily individually. So what are some of the key reasons why it's so important to feed those buffers? Well, I, I think there's, uh, I got three, I think that I call them the big three. Number one, we already talked about, and that is to stabilize or optimize the rumen environment for the microbes. So we get optimal growth production of VFAs and amino acids as far as that goes. Second of all, a lot of the buffers will increase dry matter intake. And of course, once we increase dry matter intake, that means you should get more milk. And some of the buffers will also enhance components. I'm getting a bit nervous that we use a buffer to raise butterfat tests because usually there's bigger problems in the ration that should be addressed besides just putting a buffer into the feeding program. And of course, the big one, which is increasing in popularity, is the DCAD, uh, summer heat stress. And we're looking typically at uh, trying to get our DCADs up to a plus 300 milli equivalents per kilogram of dry matter. And usually that's a combination of sodium bicarb and potassium carbonate. Uh, the ratios just depend on how much sodium you have in the diet and how much potassium you want to have in the diet. And then you can work those ratios, typically about two to one or three to one in that area. Absolutely. All three very important reasons to feed uh, buffers and even heat stress, right? That we tend to think, oh, there's no heat stress here in the upper Midwest, right? But that's not true at all, right? Because more and more of those high producing cows, they actually require lower and lower temperatures. So it's something that is very, very key. It doesn't have to be this hard to keep cows pregnant. At Virtus Nutrition, we understand the negative impact that lost pregnancies have on a dairy's economics. Every failed pregnancy means more money spent on expensive semen, additional replacements to raise, and fewer valuable beef calves to sell. Feed what embryos need. Strata with EPA DHA, the pregnancy nutrient. So you discuss a lot of good things, a lot of import important concepts associated with the use of buffers, but you, you made a clear case when you're talking about calcium carbonate and limestone, right? So why is so important for farmers to know what they are feeding in terms of buffers? 
Well, I think, Louise, most farmers are probably going to be going with a commercial product coming from a feed co-op or company or consulting group as far as that goes. And the question is, what is in your buffer pack? So you may be feeding uh, 200 grams or half a pound of buffer pack. And the question is, well, what is in that buffer pack? Uh, is it uh, all limestone, which will make it very economical, but probably not very efficient? We could put potassium, uh, we could put in sodium bicarb, which would be more expensive, or potassium carbonate, and that's the most expensive one, typically about twice the price of sodium bicarb. So you need to ask what buffers you have and what levels are in the product. Are you feeding the correct level? Because we know in bicarb, you, you got to put enough in to have the impact in the rumen. And then you may also have a carrier feed. You may also have a yeast product in there as well. So ask yourself or ask your supplier, what is in my buffer pack? And then back calculate, are you getting enough to your cow to have the impact you want to have? Absolutely. And you know, a proper diet formulation requires that you know exactly what is getting into the cow. So I highly agree with you. So today we had the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Mike Hutchins a lot of great advice about uh, how to better utilize buffers in dairy diets. Thank you, Dr. Hutchins, for joining us today. Again, it was a pleasure uh, discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you at home for joining us for the podcast. And I hope to see you soon. Hey everyone, we are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.